The Business of Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Land Trust. Did you know sportsmen spend over $5 billion annually in hunter and angler access fees? Land Trust is a platform that connects sportsmen with farmers and ranchers like you who have untapped profits just by providing access to their land. Go to landtrust.com slash BOA, as in business of agriculture, to see how much you might add to your bottom line. Greetings and welcome to another episode of the Business of Agriculture podcast. Got a great episode for you today. Very timely. We're talking about meat. We're talking about beef specifically. We're talking about animal protein. We're talking about shocks to the marketplace. We're talking about problems in the marketplace. Problems way before we ever had a cyber attack. Got Brad Coima with Coima, Coima, Coima and Berelick trading out of uh, Sue, uh, out of, he's out of Iowa. It doesn't matter where he is because he can help you no matter where you are. You know what? He's a, he's also a beef feeder. So he's in the industry and he as he sees it from the trading side and he sees it from a producer side. Farm guy from Iowa, smart dude. Brad and I met when I did a presentation here not too long ago. And I said, and he, he was my warm up. He got up on stage and did his presentation and I did mine. And I said, you know what? You need to be on the Business of Agriculture podcast. So Brad Coyma, welcome to the Business of Agriculture. Thank you so much for having me on. You're very kind. I think you've uh, probably overhyped me already. So I don't mind overhyping you. And you know what? You shouldn't be so you shouldn't be so uh, conservative about uh, by yourself. You're, you've got some uh, really good stuff. And so it's not just everybody that gets to come on here and, and give us their wisdom. Before we get to Brad talking about, again, beef, specifically meat, the whole entire meat processing industry and problems that even were here and definitely glaring us in the face before we even got to this whole cyber attack. He's going to cover all that. Before we ask Brad our first round of questions, I want to remind you that uh, we've got two great sponsors. Land Trust, you heard about up front. The other one is Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a software solution for your agricultural enterprise. So you've got this ag enterprise, you've got inputs, outputs, you've got cash flow issues, you've got stock and grain, you've got cattle, you've got acres, you've got inventory. For God's sakes, you need software to help you manage all that. Harvest Profit is just that solution for you. Harvest Profit is software that works as hard to make your operation profitable as you work. Go to harvestprofit.com to see if they have a product that will fit you, and they indeed do. All right, Brad, uh, you're up on stage. I'm, uh, you know, last month, I'm getting ready to go on. I'm like, this dude knows what he's talking about. And you said some things were really interesting about beef specifically and the problem. Too few processors. Four yes, meat processing companies here in the United States of America control over 80% of every morsel of meat that we eat, unless it's processed at the place down the road like me, right? Right. Well, specifically beef. Uh, yeah, uh, every morsel of beef that we eat. Yeah, the big four they're known mm -hmm. as in the industry, right? You know, Cargill, Tyson, National, and JBS, which has just, you know, been in the news, of course. So, um that packer concentration would be the term we would use. Uh, uh, oligopoly is the, uh, you know, college 2000 level, right? Uh, that's the word you'd use. It's disturbing. Uh, and for some of us like me, uh, it, it's, uh, it reminds us of uh, the, the, the gas business, the oil business of 30 and 40 years ago, you know? So um, I think it's a huge problem. I think every time we have one of these black swan event type things like a mini deal like that hack was, but a more bigger deal was uh, COVID. And then of course that fire in August of 2019, um, you know, so now you've got to deal if it impacts one, it impacts such a big share of the industry because there's just, there's not enough players. Yeah. So we're going to cover all that. We're going to get to the cyber attack, but I always try and do this thing. We assume that most of the people who listen to this are ag professionals, ag, you know, farmers, ag industry professionals. But remember, we also encourage all of our people. I encourage you, dear listener and viewer, share this podcast with your non-ag friends so that they'll understand the business. Let's start at the beginning because you are a beef uh, producer there in Iowa. And you do it uh, where you are, the owner of all these calves, you buy steers. So let's just for a little bit of background, because sure. the average person doesn't really understand how these things work. They know that if they come and buy a quarter of beef for me out here in my pasture, I feed them and then they go down to the place down the road and you get your half of beef. That's not how most people buy their beef or their meat at all. They go to the grocery store. Just give a little bit of background. There's cow calf people that are out there with 
brood cows somewhere on a range, maybe in Oklahoma, wherever it should be. And then they have calves. And then those little calves get, uh, you know, raised up to about five to 600 pounds, let's say, right? Take us from there. Okay. So that traditionally, that would be the kind of uh, animal that I would purchase or the traditional guy in Iowa, the, the, the medium to small uh, cattle feeder. Um, so you've got, you know, starting with the, 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 the increment of the cow calf guy, which is generally in, in, in areas that uh, uh, the ground will raise pasture, will raise grass, not suitable for row crops, right? Um, uh, cows are ruminant animals. They can process grass. I mean, you know, talking about sustainability, uh, people have a way bad understanding of how this even works. Um, yeah, they're the, one of the few animals that can actually utilize it. Well, anyway, so, they, so they, uh, a, a ruminant animal like a cow can take grass on crappy ground in some arid part of the country and then convert that into that cellulose into protein that animals can, humans can eat and, and digest. Digestible. That, that calf from those cow calf operators from wherever they should be, you know, Indiana, Oklahoma, it don't matter. They're, they're all over. And then they get generally congregated into uh, once upon weaning, and then they go to another place. And it's yep. important to understand that these news media, we're talking about JBS, Cargill, Tyson, and national beef being producers. They are not producers. They are. Well, they're the ones that, turn it into uh, to, to the steaks and the hamburger that you have to buy at the grocery store. They're processors and we call them packers. Okay, so take us that 600 pound calf from some place that's an operator, what happens then? All right, okay, so typically you go to a sale barn, Billings, Montana, for instance, okay? Uh, the, one of the last places in the universe where the true price discovery happens. You got, you've, got a, you've got a rancher that's got his 100 calves there and you've got me and 10 other guys that are going to try to buy them and we're going to find out today what they're worth and that's the way it works so you know and you buy them based on what where the futures market is or what you think the market's going to be worth you you, you consider what the cost of feed is which is a big deal right now because corn's unusually high compared to the last five years you calculate some break-even stuff and then you take them home you feed them as best you can you take care of them and and uh you know uh, like a 600 pound calf probably is on feed for six or seven months um, and, and then you uh, go through going through that process. Then, like if you live where I live, there's four, five, six different packers then uh, uh, that you try to solicit bids from to try to sell those cattle to so that they can process. Um, you know, some of them around here, you know, you got a few smaller ones in Omaha, but Tyson, Cargill, all the big names, JBS, you know, I sell cattle or try to to almost all of those. So. It's a matter of then negotiating with, for me anyway, because I don't do formulas, um, negotiating with and try to get the best bid possible for those cattle. Now, one of the things that's a little different, and I know you get it, Damien, but you know, for the audience that doesn't, um, cattle, being in cattle productions or, or any livestock production really is much different than the, than the grain production is because this is a perishable commodity. It's non-storable. Um, you know, I, even to the point where I, Kind of scratched my head a little bit with some of the ppp stuff that went on you know you had corn beans a storable commodity nothing making you sell it uh, other than economics um, where cattle you know you've got a small window of a couple three weeks where they're really of optimum quality they need to be sold yeah so i had this issue way back when because we've seen these shocks you talked about a fire in 2019 2020 if you don't remember dear listener and viewer i recorded a bunch of videos i got uh, shared around and um, uh, fortune magazine used my stuff or forbes i guess it was where i used a paper towel holder and a uh, towel paper towel uh, roll and i wrote supply chain out and i said if i crank this right here even my friends that are smart folks said I understand, Damien, why we got to be destroying pigs and like putting them in landfills or whatever. Uh, you know, why don't we just keep them? I said, where do we keep them? So a lot of people understand, like you said, this is a product that the supply chain has gotten very, very good at. Live cattle walk into a processing facility, be it in Omaha or wherever, and then out at the other end comes hamburger, essentially. I mean, they hang for a while, and that's uh, another thing. But right. <clears throat> the point is, you've got this packer issue. And so now that you've explained it, uh, again, you buy those calves and you might have a thousand of them on feed or 2000 or 3000 that you're feeding right now with your operation. And those are all getting spaced out where they're getting sold to these processing facilities. Tell the audience how that works, because they probably are like, well, I don't know. I just go to the grocery store and buy this package of meat. What happens then when that animal's ready to go? How do you go to business? All right. 
Well, we put them on what we call slang is show list. In other words, we, um, I actually hire my brother to sell my cattle for me. He, so he'll, he'll, uh, I'll look through my, my lists of cattle that I have at different feedlots. And I decide that, Hey, you know what? A uh, lot B at Eagle View feedlot is ready to harvest, ready to for slaughter. So he represents that set of cattle, say there's 208 steers, and then we think they weigh 1,500 pounds. He represents them to Tyson and to Cargill and to X and, and to JBS. Um, and then we try to negotiate the best bid possible. Um, it sounds, 15 years ago, that was my favorite part of the business. I mean, now it's, I'm hiring it done because I hate it so much because there's very little ability to do that actual negotiation because nobody's in the market. Okay. Um, You've got you've got about eighty seventy five percent of these cattle are done now on a formula, which means they're not negotiated for. That means that they've made a deal, particularly these large large corporate feed yards, more typical of the South than they are in Iowa, that they've made a deal secret. I mean, I mean, the, we don't know what the deal is, but they've got a deal that I believe is largely based on quantity that they provide the packer, not quality. So it's convenient for the pack. It, it's much like. Um, a hotel, uh, or like say you were, uh, I don't know, building cars and you got to order so many loads of steel, right? So you order just exactly what you need, you know? So that's what, that's what the packing thing is turned into where they've gotten so much captive supply is the term I use. We can explain what that means, but, but cattle that they don't have to go out there and competitively bid for, for people like me and, and my customers up here. So, if, if, if 75% of those cattle already tied up, it gets to be a pretty narrow field then for the last little 25% uh, of those of us that are trying to, to do that. So the, the irony is to me is the hard work is establishing that price and the rest of the formula guys are just riding on the coattails of those of us that are doing the hard work of negotiation. Yeah, so uh, those that don't have a degree in agriculture economics, you're calling it formula. <clears throat> what you're really essentially saying is those huge, huge, because we're very consolidated processors, packers, of the meat, they just need to keep that facility full. They just need to keep it so that those people, those 3,000 employees that go into a Greeley, Colorado plant are standing there every day processing cattle. And so that plant or that company, you say, has really just gone out there and told these people before they even put those calves in the feed yard, we're going to take everything you bring us and the price is going to be settled how? And that's where the formula thing comes up. Please explain that. Right. Well, so that price will be a lot. A lot of times, Damon, you're spot on that those cattle, the day they're bought are nearly are nearly dialed in that day already to the exact day that they're going to be harvested. Now, weather would play a little bit of an effect on that, you know, but um, so what a lot of these formulas are based on is, uh, for instance, in our area, it'd be like the Nebraska weighted average. So uh, part of the USDA uh, reports all these, you know, uh, 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 livestock marketing reporting sounded like a good idea. If you think about it, when it started, it's a little over 20 years ago, Damien, this whole rule that we should report what everybody's getting for their prices. Sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? I mean, because well, after all, it would it'd only be fair that Brad should know what this guy in Texas, Texas is getting for his cattle, right? Well, if you remember 20 years ago, no social media, no cell phone no technology. There was a literal problem of people actually not knowing what the market was. That is in no way the case anymore, in no shape or form. So what this whole thing is morphed into now is, so we report what they get. Backer tells the USDA, okay, the average price last week in, in, in Nebraska was $1.20. Okay, so now the formula guy is going like $1.20. Well, my deal is I get two bucks a hundred over because I guarantee that I'll give all 50,000 of my cattle to ABC Packer, right? So that's how that's how it's established. So the guys establish an average price, gets turned in, USDA reports it, and then the formula guys get a, that. A bonus over awesome. that. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> that's, that's how that deal works. You said when you were on stage, when I saw you last month, you said the problem is we've got too many captive cattle. And that's what you're explaining right there. It doesn't mean captive like they're being held captive. It means that they don't go on a free market. They don't actually get priced. And one thing that you you and I both agree on, um, any person, whether you know about ag or, and, and all or not, I know what a bushel of corn is worth 
today. I know what it's worth on the Chicago board or the CME now. And I know what it's worth if there's a grain facility, you know, 20 miles down the road. And I can go there and say, I have a bushel of corn. How much will you give me for it? That's not the case with beef. No. And, you know, you're going to get different. You, you could have probably two or three other industry experts on here uh, and, and they may give you a different view. But you're, you ask me and you're going to get mine. OK. Um, and, you know, I think that I think that one of the large problems of, of the market is is indeed captive supply. You'll get someone else that says it's capacity that we need more packers. I don't have any problem with that either. It's just that you can't snap your fingers and build a packing house, you know, you and $200 million in two and a half years until it's built. But to your point of the captive supply, it just seems like, I, I don't understand why this is such a difficult concept to understand. If, if you have more competition for the product, I don't care if it's a Mickey Mantle rookie card or if it's cattle, uh, the more, so, so what happens to the industry is Monday morning, the packer comes in and he's got all these cattle turned in on some formula. He's all like, well, geez, I'm about full. I don't need to do anything this week. Well, why would he? He doesn't have to. Right. So and then, then a lot of the formula stuff is also driven on last week's average. So when you get into a downtrending market, people just pile on because they go, well, geez, it looks like it's going lower. We better make sure we get those cattle turned in. Um, there's places in the South where packing houses, well, 90, 95, 98% maybe of their cattle are all formula deals. They don't even have to go out and buy any. So when, when you regionalize it, it gets even worse, you know, where you get a couple areas in a region where one of the major packers isn't participating at all, isn't, isn't, isn't adding anything to the competition, isn't any, doing anything for price discovery. Um, you know, that's where the industry hit this wall where the senator from Iowa, Grassley, which is where I'm from, said, you know what, we got to do something rash, rash, drastic. And he proposed this 5014 bill, which said that, Packer has to buy half of the cow, 50%, and they have to be delivered in 14 days. Um, that mean, bill is- buy 50, What's that mean again? They have to buy half of them off of a, off a free market so that we- yes, they have so to negotiate for- price. Right, exactly. They had to negotiate for half the cattle, uh, and they all had to be delivered within 14 days. Um, I love the guy, uh, it, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's like climbing Kilimanjaro, right? I mean, this is gonna be a difficult hill to climb. Um, but to do nothing, you know, I, I, I argue with people within the industry. So I'm engaged with ICA and NCBA, right? Uh, you know, they're so afraid. That stands for? Iowa Cattlemen's Association and NCBA's, I'm sorry, National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I have to remember my audience. I apologize. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association is the by far largest beef association, by far the most influential one lobby in, 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 in Washington, D.C., um, and so that's why I'm trying to engage. I'm trying to change from within. Um, but um, the, 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 there'll be others that have a, a varying view of that. But what happened here was we took this whole thing because of finally the producers and especially the small medium guys that were so tired of, especially after the fire and then after the COVID thing where we couldn't get a bid. I, I literally went through a period here last year where I went seven weeks without getting a bid on cattle. So you were right. just holding cattle back and trying to not, and just trying to not burst at the seams. Right, well, percentages of them are dying, you know, and, and, and you know, cattle guys, hog guys, I tell you what, you know, we, we care about our deal. We, and sometimes I think sometimes our animals almost get better care from the veterinarians and sometimes we do from our own doctors, right? I mean. It's not for lack of caring. So that's when I think this frustration thing boiled over completely. And so you start to get some regulatory or legislative things. And so even within the NCBA, uh, there are situations where we're working towards the potential of a, of a regulatory solution. There's a couple of senators that offer different bills. Grassley's one, Fisher from Nebraska is another. Uh, and, and so that, that, that you're going to hear an awful lot about that, I think, here in the next two or three months. Okay. So it comes down to, and this I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just set this up. You said we have too few processors, too few packers, oligopoly. Oligopoly for you, dear listener, viewer, if you've not taken Econ 101 means, you know what a monopoly is? It means one person, one company controls everything. Oligopoly means a few uh, control everything. A great example, the airlines. I travel for a living, or I used to, and I'm starting up to again. 
Damien, you just probably wouldn't fly this airline because I heard they're really bad. And I said, they're all about the damn same. And you know, the truth of it is four airlines control 84% or 81% of every airline uh, mile flown in the United States of America. If you want to get from one place to another, you ultimately have to use all the airlines. If you want to be in the beef business, you either got to set up your own little processing facility and or find a place down the road and go small scale, or you're going to have to deal with one of the four. Am I right? You're absolutely right. And, and, you know, I don't mean to sit here and, 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 and want to sound at all like that. I would be against increasing the kill capacity. Absolutely. Um, if I was a younger man, I'd probably be involved in the one that's coming up in North Platte that they're trying to get enough investment money together. They're trying to build a facility there. And that's going to be a company that's not part of the big four. Correct. Uh, the five principals actually are former big four employees. Um, that and I'm not a spokesman for him, but I I think that that maybe that structure would have some potential to to maybe thrive. But what I have seen, and I'm the old guy in the room. I, I I'm sorry, but um, they did that in uh, Tama, Iowa, a producer cooperative owned, uh, where producers invested in this this uh, slaughter facility. Seems like a great idea, right? And it is conceptually. But the reality of it is, is again, in my view, uh, the big four, the big four control also selling this meat. And for instance, the hides, okay, they're worth quite a bit of money. Uh, the tallow, the ears, the oxtails, the clods, there's stuff that nobody's ever heard of. And I don't even know what they are, some of it, but <laughs> some of that weird stuff, you know, everybody can sell a ribeye. Everybody, Everybody can sell, sell ribeye. ribeye steak, but you're saying that when you've got this few of processors, it really means that they not only can control the pricing, they also sort of control the distribution. Uh, exactly. Right? So in and, my and view. All, and all the byproducts, because the average person saying, crap, I never even thought about that. You mean bone meal? You know, what the hell's bone meal? Well, it means you take the bones after you cut the meat off of it, and then the bone gets processed and becomes this byproduct, and we use it for what, fish food or some such thing. I mean, I'm just going off here. T hides, uh, the leather, obviously. Well, if you've got a smaller facility, like the one where I take my steers to down the road from me, they kill seven, nine steers a week. They have to pay somebody to come pick up their hides. Whereas if you are this huge facility and you kill, what's a big facility kill, Brad? Like in 6,000 a day. 6,000 steers a day. You're not paying somebody to come and get your hides because some leather processing company wants that damn leather, right? Yeah, they're paying you 40 bucks each unless they're from Mexico because they're too thin and they get discounted about half. So you're right. I mean, they, 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 without beating this up to a point, but I mean, what happens, of course, it's also the economy of scale. So let's just say theoretically at a large big box outfit that starts with W theoretically, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're buying all their hamburger or they're buying all their whatever it is, bacon. You know, you think that you're going to get into that deal? You know, yeah, if you're a little guy. You said if you're a smaller scale processor, instead of 6,000 cattle per day, just at your one Greeley, Colorado place, you're going to do 6,000 a week, which is still amazingly big, but that's your entire company. And then all of a sudden does Walmart uh, pick up the phone? The only reason, in my opinion, Walmart picks up the phone is to use you as a lever to go and beat the other person down. Cause that's how Walmart does business. Hey, this place over here in um, Iowa, is smaller scale, they want to, to sell their product through us. And they told us they'd sell to us for this. So JBS, are you gonna match their price? And of course, that's what ends up happening. That becomes a ratchet down. Right. So we're getting, as much I, as we're getting to that, I forgot, I went over my time limit and I, I owe it to my friend, Nick Hora, but the founder of Harvest Profit, the software company, he's not a software engineer. He's just a smart dude that saw a need in the marketplace. He said, these agricultural people need a software program that helps them maintain their books and be profitable on their ag enterprise. That's why he started harvestprofit.com. You can get a free 14 day trial if you go to harvestprofit.com. Harvest Profit's name of the company, harvestprofit.com is the website back to the beef. Okay, so that's what we're really talking about here is essentially it's the old issue of the bigs essentially keep it that keep you know they can control the marketplace and so is that why we don't have a bunch more smaller uh, processors well i think that that's the fear uh, i i 
and I don't want to be discouraging doing this. You know, I maybe the right environment, maybe with some incentives, maybe with some, you know, help, maybe it, it's done. But, I, you know, I saw the Tama one basically go through two total different sets of ownerships uh, before they really began to thrive. And ironically, it really didn't start to really work really well until National, one of the big four, bought it from that second group of investors that was trying to run it, you know. So, <clears throat> hey, I'm all about if they want to expand, I, but I, I think realistically, uh, a better solve in the short term in particular is to try, you know, there, there's even a movement to try to break up the oligopoly. I don't know how that works. Um, I don't know that there's a legislative will for that in this environment. Uh, th so know. this came up last year, and that's why I want to get into this. Uh, if you're paying attention to the news, and even if you're not, you're going to now because you're catching here on the Business of Ag podcast. Uh, hackers, hackers, cyber attack, allegedly from Russia. And people pretending this is a group of criminals that just happen to be living in Russia are full of shit. It is Russia, the country, Russia, the government. Uh, I don't think that it's, uh, it's, it's lost on anybody that's a thinking person. And they obviously are messing with our food supply. They're messing with our infrastructure. They're messing with... Uh, JBS, the world's largest meat processing company. And this is the second time that we've had a shock to the system in just over a year. Last April, it was because workers at meat plants, even right here in Indiana, the two hog facilities, not too far from where I'm sitting right this minute, uh, had to shut down because uh, workers were getting COVID and we didn't really know that much about COVID. And then we shut these places down and it caused a big shock to our protein system. And then ultimately about four weeks later, two to four weeks later, we saw rationing at uh, Costco of meat. So here's the thing. I said then, I said, maybe this is an issue of too big. Is there political will to break up these four big companies? And they said, well, what would that do? Well, you'd have then opportunity for smaller processors. And so the old thing of spreading your risk, the old farmstead, if you drove around out here, there's a reason they had a chicken barn and it was just far enough away from where the cow barn was, where the chicken, the chickens were over there. It was not only a disease, it was if one of them catches on fire, the fire department coming out and a horse and buggy ain't going to put you out of fire. It's spreading your risk. If we did that with meat processing, instead of 6,000 animals in, you know, at one place per day, it's six places in a thousand. And then all of a sudden we've spread out our risk. The cyber attack brought this concept up again. What needs to happen, Brad? Well, you're right. This, this, this last one I thought too was a, so here, JBS, they kill about 25,000 cattle a day. That's their capacity. So to, 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 to use your little uh, the example there of, I grew up that way, by the way, one milk cow, you know, cattle, hogs, chickens, you know. Uh, well, I think the average person doesn't really understand it. If they drove through the countryside and said, God, there's nine buildings at that old farmstead. It was first off, you build it when you needed it, but you also spread stuff around. The chickens were over there. The pigs were over there. The cows were, the beef cows were over there. The milk cows were over there. The turkeys were in a different place. The hay was somewhere. You did it so that if somehow lightning strikes, you're not starving, right? Correct. You didn't wipe out the entire operation. Exactly right. So now that we've let this this industry consolidate to the point where <clears throat> lightning, lightning struck, <laughs> right? And 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 JBS, which you know, just in I just just in the U.S., twenty five thousand cattle a day. To give you some perspective. Uh, day before yesterday, we harvested ninety five thousand cattle. A week ago, the same day, we harvested one hundred and twenty thousand cattle. So there's your twenty five. Obviously, as a goat's rear on the hillside. Yesterday, we killed 105. So they're slowly getting back online. So now, where did those 40,000 cattle go? They didn't disappear. They're still getting fed this high-priced corn, and they're still backed up in a feed yard. But to your point, so if you can, if you can impact, um, what is that, 20% uh, by by one, you know, by hitting on one of the big four, uh, you know, would it be better? If instead of JBS having four plants that killed 6,000, if you had four people that killed 6,000 at each plant instead of having them 24, obviously it would be way better. Um, how you get there, I, I don't know. You know, that's over my pay grade, whether there's enough, they did it in the oil industry, you know, but I, you know, I, maybe this political environment actually is better for that, Damien. They seem to, this, this group seems to hate anybody that's successful. Maybe, maybe <laughs> we can, maybe we can hate on the big packers. 
Yeah, well, it's never happened with airlines. You know, uh, I've I've seen this again and again because if you're if you're again an observer, Ma Bell was the the one that needed broken up. So if you're old enough to remember that, Ma Bell was in charge of all telecom, broke them up, and then you'd say, "Yeah, see, well, look what we did." Yeah, well, now it's Apple, Google, uh, <laughs> Microsoft, and three other companies that are in right. terms of communication or tech. So. Um, what about the, the cyber attack? Because I saw it and I saw, oh boy, and uh, this is going to throw another, um, shall we say, bunch of fear into the marketplace. But then it, it got quelled pretty quickly. I don't think this is the end of it. I believe that we will see this repeated because the folks that are out to do us harm realize how effective this is. Well, and apparently. Thing, essentially as sort of the 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 playbook i know that scares me and, and apparently how easy it is damien i mean um the 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 i, I cannot confirm uh but the, you know the, the the strong rumor is of course that there was also a ransom involved with this thing just like there was with that pipeline um and you know because of cryptocurrency currencies uh the traceability or the you know what i mean i mean it, 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 it the, the, seems like the, the the playing field is wide open unfortunately for that kind of kind of thing and 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 so yeah it seems to me like it i can how come the good guys aren't as smart as the bad guys that we can't figure out a way to stop this uh, cyber attack but i i'm scared to death that you're absolutely right and what's what's this to me, if we can't do something to protect the food supply, you're going to have a real mess. But yeah, um, so that's my. That, so you've told me what needs to happen. You you think there needs to be legislation about price discovery? Obviously, that's a thing, and it all boils back to you said the problem is when you've got four companies that are this big. It, um, you, you know, I saw one thing in the news, and we did this before we went on air here, where I said it was essentially trying to make everybody calm. Said, hey, don't worry about that JBS thing. 80% of the food supply is controlled by, or meat is controlled by three other companies. I don't think they realize that is kind of what we're saying is the problem <laughs> that we've got too little. So essentially it all boils down to, we've got this situation. What would, what would make us more insulated? What would make us safer? What would make us less prone to having panics or even brief shortages? You know, and the average person is probably saying, Brad, well, 120,000, you went down to 95,000, that's per day, right? Yes. And they're probably saying, well, can we live with 25,000 less steers worth of uh, meat per day? Yeah, maybe, as long as there's other stuff, pro, you know, other pork, chicken, whatever. But what if it's 25% across the board? Is America ready to have 25% less meat on their plate? They better be used to a $35 ribeye instead of a $15 ribeye at high V then, you know. Yeah, it's going to be pricey, obviously, less supply and demand stays constant. So it's either we reduce our intake by 25%, should we have problems like this, or we adjust our prices up. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but that whole line of thinking, uh, and I know it's not yours, but this is such bullshit that we're getting fed because you've got global demand, you've got domestic demand, you've got more demand than we've ever had in the history of the red of protein, of red meat, ever. Mm -hmm. You know, you can summarize it in one word, China. And, 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 and so we got guys running around with the solution of, well, maybe we should just have less of them. I guess let's just, let's have less cattle. That'll solve, all solve the problem. You go tell that guy in Billings, Montana, that, that the solution to the cattle industry is that you kill a bunch of your cows. Um, no, we've got to, we, we, we've, we've got to dilute down the, 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 the oligopoly that is to that. There's more players. We got to somehow in tell them to, 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 to get involved in the negotiation of the cash cattle market. And if, if you don't think that that's not important to what the consumer pays then you're missing it, because right now you've got the widest spread in the history of the universe for what you have, what the, what the packers getting compared to what the producers getting. And, and, and so, you know, if, if something doesn't change, you're going to, the example I always use at these meetings is I'll ask anybody, does anybody know what a chicken's worth? And they all look at me like, of course not. Of course you don't know what a chicken's worth because there's no reason to know because Tice, whoever, the big conglomerate has has the whole vertically integrated deal and they decide what you're going to charge, what you're going to pay for. I yeah, so that's, that's the thing that I guess we're, we're going to leave our listener with, whether you're in the industry or not. Um, what we have happening, and it's been now three to four months, probably. How long has it been going on? Yeah. Three to four months, the spread between what Brad and his feed lots in Iowa are getting for cattle that are on the hoof versus what you're paying at 
the grocery store. He said hy V, reflecting that he is from Iowa. It could be Walmart. It could be Kroger. It could be Safeway, Albertsons, whatever, uh, Dixie, uh, Winn-Dixie. The spread. Say it again there, Brad. Okay. So there's a live cattle value, which right now is basically $1.20, 100 And then there's boxed beef price value. And today that's at 340 It's never been higher than that, except for a few weeks during the height of COVID last year when we couldn't kill any. The old high prior to COVID for box beef prices was 264. So now we're at 340, ridiculously higher. Now I track some of this retail prices, but you know, it's just difficult to track retail prices because retail price in Memphis is Los Angeles. Sure, right. Susan or Iowa is, is, but is this, hard. But you know? The one thing that we can track is we know what you're getting. If you put steers on a semi today to, to go and get processed at this, what you're getting versus what the consumer in anywhere, even Des Moines, Chicago is paying is the greatest spread it's ever been. And who is making that money? Thank you. Because if I could make it even more real, the guy that's feeding these cattle is not making any money right now. In fact, they're probably losing a little money because of the cost of game. Not probably. I know I live you're, it. But you're, losing, you're, losing, you're losing money on every steer you sell right now. And who is making this money when we have record spreads between what you're receiving and what the consumer is paying? Who's making that spread? The packer is making conservatively 1200 bucks per animal. Per animal. Yeah. One one outfit that kills, say, 6,000 cattle here is making a couple of million dollars a day just on what they're doing on the process. 1200, 1200 bucks per uh, animal, uh, 1,400 pound steer, let's say, on average, they're making uh, almost a buck, a buck a pound on that, and you're at break even on it. So um, something has to give. I guess it would be my thing. I, I see something has to give, or they big beef companies, processors, are going to have to become vertically integrated and take on the risk, because eventually Brad Coima says, I ain't doing it. Correct. Well, that's... That's why I'm in this fight. It's 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 you know it, it's a living, yes, but it's a way of life for me. I mean, it, it, it it's something that I, I love doing it. I did it with my dad, my brothers, uh, my kid does it. I, I'd love to have an opportunity for my grandkids to do it. It's it's a great place to grow up. You grew up on a farm, you know how that is, right? I don't want to be somebody's hired man. I came back. I uh, I'm a farm the farm guy, so I'm I don't think most of the end of what I love about the cattle guy, Damian, is he's the last fiercely independent guy in agriculture and i'm not taking anything against because i'm a crop farmer too but you know there a lot of agriculture's pretty quick to stand with their hand out right and for the most part the cattle guy has said you know what just just leave me alone and i'll try to paddle my own canoe here right and 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 but to to, to take every advantage away from the independent cattle guy and give it to the corporate pretty soon you end up being a hired man and i don't think that that's what the fiercely independent cattle guy wants i know that's not what i yeah, I, I agree with that. Now, the one good thing, and I've had an episode, if you're listening and watching this, I did an episode, of, say, about a year ago about is it time for smaller scale meat processing? And a guy who uh, is a bit of a friend and fan of this show, and I God, I can't remember now where he is. I think he's in Oklahoma. I'm going on memory. Uh, so you can go back and find that episode. And there is, it looks like, opportunity. The thing is, it's smaller scale uh, it's not like what even Brad's talking about. You're talking about more local where it's they could a, a place that's just big enough to take one pin from Brad. And the tough part is of scale, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, well, small I, scale, meaning the people from the suburbs that want, you know, to buy a quarter of beef, that's fantastic. And we do have a bunch of those little facilities around here where I am and they do fine, but they're able to process a dozen steers a week or something. And that's just not going to make a big dent in the supply of how many 120,000 a day. Well, God bless those guys that are doing that deal. But you're right. From a scale standpoint, it's, you just need thousands of those kinds of little facilities, honestly. Um, I um, Although I'll tell you what, you know, there's been some studies done that uh, by, you know, guys with the more letters behind their name than I have, um, the, you know, that tip, you know, I always say in my business, there's a fine line between too many and not enough. Um, and, and, you know, there's been some estimates that say if we could increase slaughter capacity by even 3,000 to 3,500 head, it probably at this level of supply is enough to tip the scale back in the in the advantage of the guy that owns them, you know, where you have more negotiating power. So Only a few thousand. So you're talking about like one and a half to two percent, three, two to three percent increase in processing facilities or, or number would give you change the marketplace. 
Well, that's what some of these PhDs are telling me. I, I find that a little bit hard to believe too, but you know, I, I, I choose to be an optimist. I hope so. Um, as a dairy kid, I can tell you that I've heard of these PhDs at these ag conferences at dairy meetings say, you got 9.3 million dairy cows in the country. And you know, the problem is we got about that 0.3. If we just got down to under 9 million, milk prices would go up and we wouldn't have this surplus where we're trying to get the government to buy cheese. I've been hearing that one for 10 years now. And I'm like, bullshit, because mm. one thing I know about dairy people, if there's a chance to sell a nickel's worth more milk at a profit, by God, they're going to they're going to just start producing that stuff up. So that's the one thing that we uh, we always have the experience when you uh, I mean, right. We make the assumption it's a neighbor that's going to be the 0.3% instead of you. Yeah, I, uh, right. Right. I, I, I have a different way of saying it. I, I always say, you know, if you don't have shit on your boots, I really don't really uh, value what your opinion is on what I got how to run the business. So. I like that. All right. So we've talked about cattle. We talked about the supply. We talked about the processors. We talked about too few processors. We explained a lot of stuff here. Dear listener, dear viewer, share this with one of your non-ag people so they'll understand what exactly happened, why it happened on the cyber attack issue. The point is, if the biggest meat processor in the globe has to shut down, it puts a big crinkle on it. So it goes back to supply chain. This is the Business of Agriculture podcast brought to you by Harvest Profit. Go to harvestprofit.com. Read a couple of articles that Nick Horeb puts up there. Very smart stuff. And also do an experiment with their software if you haven't already. It's a it, it's a good company. And I'm really glad that uh, Nick has been with me for all these months and almost a year and a half, two years now. Okay. Brad Coima at Coima Coima and Baralek Trading out of Sioux, not Sioux Center. Where are you? No, Sioux Center is right. Sioux Center, Center Iowa. Iowa. All right. If they want to get a hold of you, how do they do so? 800-358-3047. And the, you know what? They could just set up a trade account there, give you a few hundred thousand dollars, and then you could turn it into millions for them, right? Yeah, no, I, you know I can't say that kind of thing, Damon. But I just said it for you. I, <laughs> All right. So he's a, he's a sharp dude. He's a cattle feeder. He's a great farmer. And he's also uh, the the, uh, the managing partner there at Coy McCoy and Barrel of Trading. So thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. Till next time, it's the Business of Agriculture. Thank you for tuning into the Business of Agriculture podcast sponsored by Land Trust. Land Trust partners with farmers and ranchers to capture pure profit from sportsmen seeking new experiences and places to hunt and fish. Land Trust built the platform and does the marketing. You maintain 100% control of access and activities, and you set the rules. There's no cost or obligation when you list, and the next 10 Business of Agriculture listeners who go to landtrust.com BOA are eligible for a gift worth over $2,000.